Welcome back, everyone. This is a uh, video lecture number two on classical conditioning. Uh, so let's do a quick review of what we just learned um, of how to make a conditioned response. Sometimes you'll hear it called a conditioned reflex. It's kind of the same thing. Um, so first, we have a neutral stimulus. So like a bell, uh, we have an unconditioned stimulus like a donut. And uh, the unconditioned stimulus will elicit an unconditioned response, such as salivating. Um, so the administration of the U.S., the unconditioned stimulus, is contingent on the presentation of the novel stimulus. In other words, if you just have an unconditioned response, or a stimulus and an unconditioned response, that's not learning. That's just natural. So in order for it to uh, be learning, in order to make a conditioned reflex or response, you need a neutral stimulus along with your unconditioned stimulus. Now, over time, over repeated representations of this system, then you're going to be able to get your conditioned reflex by just presenting your conditioned stimulus. So notice that the conditioned stimulus is the exact same as the former novel stimulus. The novel stimulus changes its name to conditioned stimulus, and now just the conditioned stimulus elicits a conditioned response. So, Let's talk about the unconditioned stimulus. So to be effective as an unconditioned stimulus, uh, the U.S. should evoke a strong bodily response, right? So that's a, so it, the bodily response would be that uh, unconditioned response. So that could be brain stimulation, uh, that could, or sorry, uh, unconditioned response could be brain stimulation, drugs, or loud noise. Um, and then your bodily response would obviously be like a startle to the loud noise, brain stimulation, it could cause you to move, um, anything like that. So the more intense your U.S. is, the more intense your unconditioned stimulus is, the easier it is to produce a conditioned response to a limit. In other words, um, the unconditioned stimulus should produce a strong unconditioned response. And then you can use this unconditioned stimulus along with a neutral stimulus to produce a strong conditioned response. Okay, so the stronger the US, the easier it is to produce a CR. So unconditioned stimulus can be classified as two different things. They can be uh, appetitive, so a stimulus that the individual finds pleasant. So that could be food or play. Um, and the other one, say like drugs sometimes. Um, or it could be aversive. Okay. And so that's a stimulus that the individual finds unpleasant. So that's a large noise or darkness or any, or like being bit, right? So something negative. So an unconditioned stimulus can be positive or negative. So again, let's talk about some nice examples. Um, so some appetitive, I'm not good at that pronunciation, but you know what I'm saying. So good conditioning um, would be to calm your easily agitated dog. You can decide to use classical conditioning. In other words, um, if your dog's like super excited all the time or maybe has like some anxiety, you can actually use classical conditioning to calm them down. So what you want to associate the command calm with the feeling of relaxation, right? So you want your conditioned response to be a feeling of relaxation. And you want the word calm to do that. But naturally, when you just say calm to a dog, if a dog's never heard the word calm before, they're not going to feel relaxed. They don't understand what that means. So calm is going to be your neutral stimulus. Okay? So now you need to find some sort of 
unconditioned stimulus that naturally brings about the feelings of relaxation. So a great example of that is petting, right? Lots of dogs and cats like to be pet. So when you naturally pet your dog, uh, the dog will naturally calm down. They'll get that calming feeling. Their, their uh, parasympathetic nervous system will kick in. Well, we're connecting things, guys. So we've got our US. We've got our NS, our neutral stimulus calm. So now we need to associate the word calm with petting. So what you're going to do is every time when your dog gets agitated, you're going to go to your dog and start petting him while saying the word calm, right? So you're creating an association between the word calm and petting. And over time, you'll be able to just say the word calm, and the dog will naturally, um, due to our appetitive conditioning, calm down just when they hear the word calm. Because they will associate the word calm with the physiological calming response that's naturally occurring when they get pet. Now, let's talk about some aversive conditioning. So, you don't want wolves to eat your sheep, right? You have sheep, they're your livestock, obviously, wolves eating them, that's a bad thing. So, you don't want that to do it. So, you need to use classical conditioning to make the wolves not want to eat them anymore. So, what you need to do then is associate sheep with a negative outcome. So, how you can do that is you can spray a non-lethal poison on your sheep. So, it won't hurt the sheep. It won't kill the wolves. Because um, just killing the wolves, that's not going to help the problem. Uh, other wolves will just come. Uh, so, non-lethal poison sprayed on your sheep. Um, now, non-lethal poison naturally produces a vomiting, very sick feeling in the wolves. So now, when they eat the sheep, they're going to also ingest the non-lethal poison, and they're going to get sick. Well, over time, if they do this enough, then what they're going to do is they're going to associate the taste of sheep with getting sick. So over time, they're not going to want to eat sheep because they don't want to get sick. And so that's an example of aversive conditioning. So we also have different types of CS-US pairings. So CS is uh, conditioned stimulus and US is unconditioned stimulus. Um, so there's different pairings. In other words, different time periods in which you can uh, present them together. So the first one is called a forward short delay. So, for this, then the CS gets turned on first, um, and then about halfway or three quarters of the way through the presentation of your CS, your US turns off. So we have a short period of time where both the CS and US occur, um, but then the CS will turn off and the US will uh, be there. So pretty much it's like you it's like the dog example with Pavlov again. Remember, when the students, the grad students, open the door, it will cause a bell to ring. So that's before they're get, uh, beforehand. Now, if we say it creates a really long type bell, like a like wind chimes or something, then the bell is going to continue going, and the U.S. would be getting food. So they'll get the food while the bells are still ringing. So the bell's going to start. It's going to continue going. While the bells are still going, they're going to get the food. The bells will stop as they continue to eat the food. So when they first get the food, the bells are on. By the time they finish the food, the bells are off. Okay, so this forward short delay um, is one of the most optimal learning periods. Uh, and so we learn best using this forward short delay um, because of uh, the association, but also the separation. So we have a separation of the CS and US. You can see both of them individually, but then we also have this overlap. 
So having individual plus overlap is uh, optimal learning. Now there's another type called forward trace. So with forward trace, then this would be uh, the condition stimulus would turn on. So this would be again the bell. So they walk in, a bell rings, it stops ringing, and then the unconditioned stimulus is presented. So this is the food. So bell rings, turns off, little bit of time, food is presented. Now, this uh, type of pairing um, can be effective, but only if this delay, this period in between the CS turning off and the US turning on is short enough. So if it's less than about three seconds, then this is very optimal. But if this time period is too long, if it's about five seconds or a minute, anything like that, then you're not going to be able to get a strong association between your US and your CS. So forward trace can be effective, but only if it has a short delay. Now we have two more types. Uh, the first one would be simultaneous. So obviously they're occurring simultaneously. So the CS and US are presented at the exact same time. So they turn on at the same time, they turn off at the same time. Now, does this work learning-wise? Yes. However, it just causes the learning to occur slower, uh, mostly because the animal or the human, whoever is being taught, tends to focus on the US because that's what they're really interested in. That's what's giving them that response. So they're kind of, the CS is kind of happening in the background and they're not focusing on it. Um, so learning does occur, but it takes a lot more time. Okay, so it would have a longer acquisition phase. Now the final type of CS-US pairings we're going to talk about is called backwards. So backwards is like the forward short delay, but it's backwards. Uh, so we present the US first, so that'd be like the food we present first, and then once the food's taken away, then we turn on the sound. We turn on the conditioned stimulus. So we have the US, which during the US, you know, that's when you're going to get the, uh, the response. And then when the U.S. is done, then we turn on the condition stimulus. Now, can this work? Sure. Um, but it doesn't work very well. So this is the least productive way of learning. It results in very little learning. Um, so again, it's not the optimal presentation of the pairings. So how can we enhance our acquisition? How can we, uh, you know, make that association between the CS and US stronger? Uh, the first one's pretty easy. You can just present the pairings a lot more times. The more you present them, the stronger the acquisition. Uh, you can also make sure that you're using an intense, aversive, unconditioned stimulus. Uh, and that will actually reduce the number of uh, pairings that you need to present. You can actually have a good acquisition after just one trial using a very intense aversive US. Um, for um, positive US, that additive US, uh, then you're almost always going to need multiple pairings or multiple trials. Um, because they're not as intense. Um, again, you can use those forward pairings that we talked about. That's the best pairing to use for, um, for learning. And you can also use a short time interval between the onset of the CS and the onset of the US. So how do you end an association? So say we, you know, you trained your dog to start to salivate or drool every time it hears a bell, which is fun in the lab, but it's not really fun all the time, right? So how do you stop that? Um, so that's where we do this thing called extinction. 
So extinction is the process in which the conditioned stimulus is presented in absence of the U.S. So uh, what it does is it causes the conditioned response to weaken and eventually disappear. In other words, in order for learning to kind of keep happening, you need to, you know, enough times, if you ring a bell enough times, a dog's going to learn, it's going to um, kind of habituate back to learning that when you ring a bell, well, I'm not getting food, so why am I drooling, right? It's going to learn that over time, and that's what we call extinction. So to avoid extinction, you just need to present the US with the CS again, and it'll strengthen your learning. But if you want it to extinguish, then you just stop presenting the US. And over time, uh, the conditioned response will disappear. So here's an example of what kind of happens. So here, this is the strength of the conditioned response. When you're first starting out, then the conditioned response is pretty weak. It's pretty much nothing. And this is this acquisition phase. This is the learning phase. So we have the CS plus the US. Um, so the conditioned response plus the unconditioned response. Over time, we get a strong uh, CR. However, once we remove the unconditioned stimulus, so we only have the CS, then that strength of the CR is going to weaken over time. Now, there's this other thing over here called a spontaneous recovery. So let's talk about that. What is a spontaneous recovery? Spontaneous recovery is if the CS, so the conditioned stimulus, is presented again following a delay after extinction and seemingly ex uh, and a seemingly extinct conditioned response reappears. Um, now, a spontaneous recovery almost always is a weaker conditioned response than a normal conditioned response. So, let's go back to this fun graph and talk about that. Okay, so here we've got that acquisition, so CS plus US. We have got extinction, so we just present the CS alone. So over time, the conditioned response gets even super weak, and we're going to kind of stop responding to the conditioned stimulus. So that could be like a bell. Now, let's say there's a positive time. So now you have decided to ban all bells from your house. So for like a week or two, your dog doesn't hear any bells. But then one day, you ring a bell again. Just out of the blue, you ring a bell. What can happen, it doesn't always happen, but what can happen is your dog will start to salivate again. So even though it's been a week or two uh, without hearing a bell and your dog's already gone through extinction, your dog's going to spontaneously respond in a conditioned way. You're going to get a conditioned response. Um, and again, you can notice how this conditioned response is a lot weaker than the peak over here, right? It's pretty weak. Um, but again, if you continue to, uh, like, ring a bell, you're going to get that extinction again. So spontaneous recovery is after extinction, there's a pause, so you, no CS is allowed during the pause. And then suddenly you ring the bell again, you have a CS again, you're going to get a weak uh, conditioned response. Now, if you continue to uh, use the conditioned stimulus, then you're going to continue. You're pretty much going to have a second extinction phase. Okay, so it's acquisition, extinction, pause, spontaneous recovery, and then second extinction. So now let's talk about this fun thing called stimulus generalization. So this is the process in which once a conditioned stimulus has been established, uh, then a similar stimuli may also produce a conditioned response. So for example, remember when we were using a 
tuning fork as our like bell sound, so as our condition stimulus. So if the original uh, tuning fork we were using was at a thousand hertz, that was its uh, frequency, then even if we use a tuning fork of a different frequency, then we can still get a conditioned response. So this is stimulus generalization. Stimulus discrimination is where we exhibit a less pronounced conditioned response to conditioned stimulus uh, that, so conditioned uh, stimulus that differ from the original conditioned stimulus. So the CSS is like that generalized uh, conditioned stimulus. So again, the tones we, you know, we were trained here. This is the original one. Now, if we differ away, we still get some response, but it's a weaker response than to the original. Um, so that's stimulus discrimination. So stimulus generalization is we can generalize to things that are slightly different than the original condition stimulus. Stimulus discrimination is we, uh, well, that happens, we still respond strongest to the original, and then things, as they get uh, further and further away in similarity from the original CS, then we get a weaker CR. So then we've got higher order conditioning. So this is a chain of events involving two conditioned stimulus. So this expands the influence of condition, classical conditioning on behavior. In other words, classical conditioning can occur without a US. So let's see an example of this. So going back to this original image, um, so again, we've got um, our dog that has been trained, so this is during acquisition, during conditioning, to associate uh, the conditioned stimulus of a, uh, the tone with food. Uh, after conditioning, we've got a tone as the conditioned stimulus uh, leads to an conditioned response, right? So we're going to take this dog that has now been trained to associate a tone with salivating, and we're going to present it with a new neutral stimulus. So you present a black square to a dog, dog's not going to salivate, it's not going to start drooling, it just doesn't make sense. However, if we do higher order conditioning, where we take our CS1, so the first condition stimulus, our tone, and we pair it with the black stimulus, or the black square, the dog's going to salivate. Why? Because our CS1 is there, and it's been trained to associate CS1 with our conditioned response. Now, after higher order conditioning, then the dog will now be able to associate the black square, which is now CS2, so conditioned stimulus 2, with salivating, with the conditioned response. So you see how the neutral stimulus, it's the same thing, where the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus, which leads to a conditioned response. However, instead of being presented with an unconditioned stimulus, it's presented with a second condition, uh, conditioned stimulus. And so that's how higher order conditioning works. Now, you're probably wondering, you know, this is all great and fine, but why should I care? Um, so let's talk about some quick applications of classical conditioning. The first one is in a clinical setting, then you can do exposure therapy. So this is the extinction of a conditioned response through exposure uh, to, uh, I have something hidden, don't I? To the conditioned response without the presence of the unconditioned response. In other words, exposure therapy is uh, pretty much the act of extinction, okay? So with that snake bite one, we just present a bunch of snakes over time and make sure that they can't bite the person, and eventually the pain associated with the snake will go away. 
because we're presenting the conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus. We also have systematic desensitization. Uh, so that's a muscular relaxation paired with gradual exposure to fear-inducing stimuli. So this is a behavioral technique that's commonly used to treat fear, uh, some anxiety disorders and phobias, and these relaxant, relaxation exercises um, can gradually um, lead to uh, lead uh, to a reduced fear uh, kind of response. So it's pretty cool. Uh, we also have something called flooding. Again, this is used in a uh, clinical setting. All of these really are. So flooding is just exposure to a fearful stimulus. Um, so again, it's very similar to exposure theory, uh, therapy, except it's like on steroids. Where exposure therapy, you'll probably start with like a picture of a snake, and then you'll move on to a toy snake, and then you'll move on to like a dead snake or something like that. Flooding is, they put you in a room with a whole bunch of live snakes. It's real intense, guys. Uh, and then we've got VR exposure therapy, so that's virtual reality therapy. Also good for uh, uh, phobias. Um, now, we don't have much time to talk about this, but we do have, um, there's, uh, when we talk about phobias and fear, um, one of the most uh, popular uh, studies to talk about is Little Albert. So Little Albert uh, was an 11-month-old baby. It's pictured here. Um, and he was shown a white rat, which was paired with the sound of a hammer. Uh, that was blowing on a gong, and he eventually became very scared of this white rat, like terrified. Um, I have a video linked here that you guys can look and learn more about little Albert. Um, I just want you to know that we don't know what's happened to little Albert since this. Um, he was kind of tested on and then just let go into the world, and no one knows what happened to him. Um, so you can, we also tested it with little Albert for uh, blocks, a rat, a rabbit, a dog, um, a seal skin coat, cotton wool, and a Santa beard. And for each stimulus, except for the blocks, um, it produced a fear reaction because he uh, associated, um, he generalized, right? Uh, he generalized the stimulus to all of these other uh, kind of soft, fuzzy things. So the final thing we're going to talk about is just disgust. So in many cases, disgust reactions are tied to stimuli that are biologically important to us, um, like animals or objects that are dirty or potentially dangerous, which means that uh, using these uh, in our conditioned learning allows us to easily acquire uh, these uh, behaviors a lot quicker. So if you want to tell, like, condition someone to be disgusted, super easy. It's the easiest, easiest behavior to teach someone using classical conditioning. So that's it for classical conditioning.